of how Canada legislated, how Canada legislated against and discriminated against the ethnic minority community. The Chinese people who came before me helped Canada build the railway to connect this country from coast to coast to coast. They went through hell to earn me the right to stand here today. They sacrificed everything and some paid with their blood. They took on the most dangerous work to help build the railway and they fought for Canada even though they were deemed as quote aliens. They were discriminated against and mistreated in ways that will make you hang your head in shame. I've learned from elders and heard stories of how it was the indigenous peoples who they themselves were experiencing discrimination came forward to support the Chinese people who helped them, who housed them, fed them, clothed them, gave them medicine and offered a sense of belonging, who treated them with humanity. In practice, they have shown the world again and again the most important life lesson is humanity. This from the very people who are experiencing colonization, the very people who suffer extreme hardships and discrimination themselves. And all of this is to say how very grateful I am to the indigenous peoples for their teachings, their kindness, and their humanity. What a privilege it is for me to learn from them, to stand with them, to thank them, to appreciate them for the teachings that they have given to all of us the teachings of lifting each other up, the teachings of being land defenders, that water is life, that Mother Earth is sacred, the teachings of being united with one heart. As a non-Indigenous person, I stand as an ally. Madam Speaker, that's why this bill is so important. We, as settlers, must learn and understand Canada's colonial history. This bill changes the text of the citizenship oath taken by the new citizens of Canada to align with calls to Action 94 of the TRC and include a reference to treaties with Indigenous peoples. The revised citizenship oath would read as follows. I swear or affirm that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada, her heirs and successors, and that I will be faithfully observing the laws of Canada, including the Constitution, which recognizes and affirms the Aboriginal and treaty rights of First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, and fulfill my duties as a Canadian citizen. I am proud to stand in this House in support of Bill C-6. Taking the citizenship oath is a significant moment in a newcomer's journey to Canada. With that privilege comes responsibility. It is absolutely essential that new Canadians understand and respect the constitutional rights of all Indigenous peoples. And in fact, I would say it's every Canadian's responsibility to be educated about the constitutional rights of Indigenous peoples. For far too long, successive governments have made aspirational statement after aspira aspirational statement about how they will build a new nation-to-nation -nation relationship with Indigenous peoples, about how they will take reconciliation seriously. But as we know, this always follows with broken promises and shameful disappointments. We have all heard that this Liberal government will be different. We all wanted to believe that would be true. But even this with this bill alone, a simple but important change has been five years in the making, despite being cited as a top priority by this government. In our last parliament at committee, I tabled an amendment to make this change in another immigration bill that was also called Bill C-6 on May 3, 2016. Unfortunately, the committee deemed my amendment out of scope, so it did not pass. Former MP Romeo Sagunash and I then wrote to the former Minister of Immigration from the last parliament in April of 2017 to offer the NDP support and assistance to realize this measure. This offer's collaboration was ignored, even though this change was outlined in the mandate letter to the former immigration minister, no action was taken until the dying days of the parliament before the election. Bill C-99 didn't even make it to second reading. In that not so subtle way, it was clear that the Liberals was merely trying to set the stage to say that they did try to make this change for the upcoming election. 
If it takes the Liberals this long to add a line in the citizenship oath, is it a wonder that they're failing so miserably on their new nation-to-nation -nation relationship with Indigenous peoples? To date, there are only nine completed calls to action out of 94, 10 with this bill. For someone who claims that this is his most important relationship, it sure as heck is moving in a snail's pace. That's 2.25 calls per year. At this rate, it will take approximately 38 more years before all of the calls to action are implemented. That would be reconciliation in 2057. Eva Jewell and Ian Mosby, Academics at the Yellowhead Institute call the Liberals' track record on the TRC calls to action, quote, dreadful progress. Canadians are coming to terms with our colonial history, and Canadians want a Canada where rights of Indigenous peoples are recognized and respected. The Liberal government is continuing, continuing to deliberately disadvantage Indigenous peoples, and Canadians from coast to coast to coast are noticing. In our country, a shocking 25% of Indigenous people are living in poverty, despite making up only 5% of Canada's population. This figure is even worse for Indigenous children. 47% of First Nations children are living in poverty, with this figure rising to 53% for children on reserves. We continue to see Indigenous peoples getting poisoned because they do not have access to clean drinking water. What is bare necessities for every other Canadian is not afforded to some Indigenous communities. What is our basic human right is being trampled on for Indigenous peoples. It is disgusting that Indigenous children are being brought to court by this Liberal government. Nine non-compliance orders. Thirteen years later, the Liberal government continue to appeal a human rights tribunal ruling that they have quote, willfully and recklessly discriminated against Indigenous kids. First Nations children have been harmed by the severe underfunding of the on-reserve child welfare system and are now being punished due to continued government neglect. Instead of providing funding to support Indigenous peoples, the government has spent almost $10 million on legal fees in the war to deny rights to Indigenous kids. If the nation-to-nation -nation relationship with Indigenous peoples is the Liberals' most important relationship, then why won't the Prime Minister just honour the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal ruling and stop taking Indigenous kids to court? At the forefront of our nation now, we continue to see this colonial approach from the government in addressing the West Suetan protests. The Prime Minister's comments on Friday were reckless and irresponsible. He said, quote, every attempt of dialogue has been made. What a joke. Right from the beginning, he was trying to avoid any accountability. He refused to meet with the hereditary chiefs when they made the request to him weeks ago. Up until February 18th, he didn't even recognize that the dispute is a nation-to-nation -nation one. And now he has the nerve to say, quote, patience has run out. Never mind the fact that Indigenous peoples have waited for 150 years for justice. This is a failure of leadership, it's a failure of reconciliation. It is time for the Prime Minister to realize every attempt of dialogue has not even been close to being made. A comprehensive, credible plan for de-escalation and dialogue is required. In order for meaningful dialogue toward a peaceful resolution, resolution to take place, the hereditary chief said they will not negotiate, quote, with a gun to the head. They want the RCMP to stand down and they want the project to halt. Given that Coastal Gas Link's final technical data report has been rejected by the BC Environmental Assessment Office, it is an opportunity for all levels of government to de-escalate. The government should seize on this opportunity. The Prime Minister says that the onus is on the hereditary chiefs. I say the onus is on him. His irresponsible words on Friday only serve to inhibit progress for a peaceful resolution. He should check himself. He should take heed the words that are being added to the citizenship oath for newcomers and take to heart Canada's obligation to the rights of Indigenous peoples under Section 35 of the Constitution, which clearly states that 
quote, the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada are hereby recognized and affirmed. He should also know that under Section 10 of the UN Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples clearly upholds the principle of free prior informed consent. And based on Canada's highest court, the Supreme Court of Canada, the landmark Delgamook decision has reaffirmed the rights of Indigenous peoples. When people throw the words of, quote, rule of law around, they need to consider all laws. Canada needs to stop using rule of law as a weapon against Indigenous peoples. Canada needs need the Prime Minister to warrior up and to show some real leadership. I will also remind everyone that Canada refused to acknowledge Indigenous titles some 40 years ago under Pierre Elliott Trudeau's government. Former Justice Thomas Berger was appointed by the then Indian Affairs Minister John Christian to lead a public inquiry into the proposed Mackenzie Valley gas pipeline. Thomas Berger said, quote, in my judgment, we must settle native claims before we build a pipeline. Canada is at a critical time in our history. Remember the election campaign from the Liberals? Choose forward, it said. Is this going forward? At a time when it's most critical for the government to firmly reinforce their commitment to Indigenous reconciliation, the Liberals are now going to delay the introduction of ONDRIP. Delaying the introduction of ONDRIP in this House at this time sends a clear message what the Prime Minister is all about. Time again, time and again, when it comes right down to it, Indigenous rights is always put on the back burner. Justice for Indigenous peoples can wait. That is the message from the Prime Minister. To further add fuel to the fire, we're seeing language from the Conservatives which have not been helpful. The more they denounce Indigenous protesters as lawbreakers and radicals, they serve to inflame the situation. Recent comments by Peter McKay, leadership hopeful for the Conservatives, promoting vigilante action by congratulating far-right groups who have associations with Yellow Vests Canada's, were highly irresponsible. Congratulating these far-right groups who have outright called for acts of violence against protesters will only contribute to worsen the situation. It is so disappointing to see a leading Conservative leadership candidate take this approach. In addition to this, we see the current Conservative leader who advocates that enforced violence is the best solution and who has the audacity to tell Indigenous protesters to, quote, check their privilege. Mm. A reply from Molly Wickham, a spokesperson from the Gidmonton camp of West Sutton Nation members, may have put it best, quote, all of Canada is subsidized by Indigenous people. All Canadian industries and transportation infrastructure rely on the theft of Indigenous land for their existence. Calling indigenous, indigenous land defenders privilege when so many of our communities are denied basic human rights, our, ser our services, sorry, are denied basic human rights and services is racist and absurd. We see time and again everyone citing the rule of law, but whose version of the rule of law are we following? The government cannot pick and choose which laws to follow and which laws to ignore. Will the rule of law continue to be only used as the government's self-serving cause, or will they finally acknowledge Canada's colonial history, the president setting landmark decisions which have defended Indigenous rights such as Delgamook? This is about the perpetuated discrimination and mistreatment to which Indigenous peoples have been subjected to for over 150 years. Look around at what is happening. This past weekend in Toronto, thousands of people came out to stand in solidarity with the West Sutton people at Toronto. In my riding of Vancouver East, we had countless rallies as well. We too had a rally at Vancouver City Hall, organized by Dakota Bear and his family, where scores of people gathered to stand in solidarity with the West Sutton peoples. The message is loud and clear. The time has come for Canada to be on the right side of history. Andrip has to be entrenched in the path forward for Canada in action. To quote statements made by Grand Chief Stuart Phillip to the media, the challenge here is to move beyond public platitudes and eloquent rhetoric about the intention of implementing the UN Declaration uh, for the Rights of Indigenous People, both federally and provincially. It has to be followed through with the work of legislative reform, 
policy development, rules and regulations that stipulate very clearly how the entire population, both hereditary and elected band council, are able to participate in an exercise to register their support or disapproval of large-scale resource development projects. We're not there yet. And again, corporations and governments attempt to take the shortcut, and we find ourselves in the courtrooms, we find ourselves on the land, upholding and defending Indigenous law. He further stated that reconciliation cannot be achieved at gunpoint, and we cannot achieve reconciliation by throwing matriarchs and elders and children in jail. We cannot achieve reconciliation by choppering in paramilitary RCMP forces in full battle gear surrounding encampments. I can tell you, if choppers start landing in your backyard and teams of heavily armed police start running through your front yard and dragging you out of your home, you'd be a little upset. This is Canada's history. This is colonialism. This is a history that newcomers must learn. This is a history that all Canadians must take to heart. This is a pivotal time for the Canadian government to prove their commitment to Indigenous peoples, to prove that they take reconciliation seriously, and to prove once, to prove once and for all that they will honour the rights of Indigenous peoples and work with them in equal footing in a new nation-to-nation -nation relationship. Again, quoting Grand Chief Stuart Phillip, the law clearly states that not only must there be substantial and thorough consultation, but there must also be consent. It must involve both parties, both elected and tradition, traditional. This is a test of the governments. This is a test of the governments will make good on their promises. I call on the Prime Ministers to seize this opportunity of not just committing to Bill C-6, but committing a truly reimagined nation-to-nation -nation relationship where indigenous, indigenous children are not taken to court, where ONDRIP is finally implemented and carried out in action as promised, and where he takes personal action and accountability to engage with West Suetan people. We are now waiting for the government to do the right thing by honouring Indigenous rights, respecting sovereignty and treating all peoples, including Indigenous peoples, with basic human rights. The time to act is now and the world is watching. Let us not just say to new Canadians what it means to honour the rights of Indigenous peoples. It is time for the government to take those words to heart and act accordingly. The NDP supports Bill C-6. The NDP consistently calls for the full implementation of all the TRC call to action. The NDP honours the work of Justice Murray, Sinclair, Dr. Cindy Blackstock and my former colleague MP Romeo Sagunash. In the words of Justice Murray Sinclair, the road we travel is equal in importance to the destination we seek. There are no shortcuts. When it comes to truth and reconciliation, we are forced to go the distance. Madam Speaker, it is time for all levels of government to go the distance. Questions and comments? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Government House Leader. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I'm glad the New Democrats are going to be supporting uh, Bill C-6. It's a pretty straightforward piece of legislation. It does respond to the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Call for Action uh, 94. Uh, that's encouraging. What's discouraging is the, I think that uh, a good portion of the member's uh, speech, uh, I, I believe, is just completely inaccurate. You know, when we take a look in terms of what it is that this government has been able to accomplish, I would challenge the member to, to demonstrate clearly what any other federal government has done in the previous 20 years. And while she's reflecting maybe on that particular statement, we can talk about the hundreds of millions of additional dollars that have been invested. We could talk about the legislation that has been brought forward. We can talk about several calls for action that has been actually acted upon uh, to date. Um, while she reflects on that, maybe she can reflect in terms of uh, NDP governments, the government of British Columbia, for example, and their role in the Wet'suwet'en uh, situation. We can talk about the, the, the worst horrific uh, regime we ever saw, 15 years of NDP in the province of Manitoba and the uh, uh, Indigenous children, what they had to endure. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. 
Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. You know, the, uh, the government uh, often say that they are on the side of Indigenous people. Look at all the great actions that we have done. All that they have to do is to look and really see what is going on. If they truly believe in what they're doing is the right path, then why are they still taking Indigenous children to court? Why did they not honour the uh, Human Rights Tribunal's nine, nine orders? Why did they not honour that, honor that, Madam Speaker? Look outside today in Ottawa, outside the House of Commons. There are scores of people protesting, standing in solidarity with the West Suinton people, but not just with the West Suinton people, but for all Indigenous people, saying to the government that we are going to hold you to account. Young people are finding their voice everywhere. Just this weekend, the, in Vancouver East, we have Youth Matters, voices from young people saying that they want the government to act honestly. I ask the member to look at himself in the mirror and truly answer the question, are they doing what they need to do or is it just anti-rhetoric? Questions and comments? You want to remember for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou? Thank you. And of course, it might come as no surprise, there was many elements of the speech my colleague gave from East Vancouver that I did disagree with. Um, and I think most importantly, she just alluded to what was happening. You know, I had the opportunity to visit communities from coast to coast to coast, and, and especially our rural remote communities relied on economic opportunities. So. Why does she take, um, why is she taking a side that is anti-resource development, anti-opportunity for the many, many Indigenous communities across this country that want to share in the wealth of this great nation? The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. Well, uh, Madam Speaker, Indigenous elders have taught me that they are the defenders of the land, that water is life that Mother Earth is sacred, that they have taken care of Mother Earth for thousands and thousands of years. And you know what, Madam Speaker? We have a climate crisis before us. If we don't take action now, it will be too late. And there is no planet B, Madam Speaker. So when we talk about investing in energy, how about investing in clean energy? How about investing in alternative energy? How about doing this taking care of our environment as well? How about engaging with Indigenous people, honouring the UN Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People, Article 10, recognizing free prior informed consent is and must be the path forward, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Questions and Comments. And Malahat Langford. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, you know, citizenship is a, is a very special thing. In my own family, we have a couple of citizenships. I'm uh, married to an Australian citizen, and our children are dual citizens. So uh, we've gotten a flavor of two very uh, different countries, but the ones that also share a lot of similarity. And, you know, I, I look at my childhood and, and what my kids are now experiencing. You know, my, my own kids have now come home uh, telling me that they have been learning uh, parts of the Hulkaminam language, which is the language of the Coast Salish peoples on Vancouver Island. And just what a, a, a monumental shift uh, has happened in the conversation on Indigenous rights and title over the last couple of decades. Now, I'm disappointed to see that the Conservatives are trying to kill this bill before we've even sent it to committee, uh, where we could hear from witnesses on, on the oath of citizenship. But, uh, you know, the Conservatives' main concerns have been about the specificity of the words. Uh, and I would just like to hear from the member from Vancouver East uh, why, given Canada's colonial history, that specificity is so important in this oath of citizenship, where newcomers to Canada are actually going to have direct words linking to our history, but also the importance of Aboriginal rights and title. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. Thank you very much, I'm Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. I want to congratulate him uh, and his family with uh, the path of having his children learn different languages. I just think that's so very beautiful. And that really is what 
this is all about, what this bill really speaks to, and that is for Canadians, newcomers, to actually know Canada's history. Why are these specific words in recognizing Indigenous rights uh, in reference to Section 35 of the Constitution so important to emphasize in, in the uh, citizenship oath? It is because for over 150 years, successive governments have ignored those rights. Even today, I would argue that governments are ignoring those rights. It may be there in written words, but people do not take it to heart. Governments, conservative governments or liberal governments have not taken it to heart. So setting a new chapter, a new phase forward, that we will have those words entrenched in the citizenship oath so every newcomer will understand that we're not just saying this, you must take this to heart and honour it. Questions and comments? Questions et commentaires? The Honourable Member for North Island Power River. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for her speech. It was an important one to be heard today in the House. One of the things that was most concerning to me in the speech uh, that she just presented to us was really what was said uh, by the Yellowhead Institute, um, and simply says this, and I quote, if the current pace holds up, which is two uh, and a quarter calls uh, to action a year, it will take approximately 38 more years before all the calls to action are implemented. Reconciliation in 2057. When we look at what's happening across our country, it is definitely clear that there's a lack of a pathway, a lack of leadership around reconciliation and a, an essential distrust. And I'm just wondering, when we look at this bill and we talk about treaties, um, we have to also acknowledge how long is this path going to take and is this the right way moving so slowly? Thank you. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and I thank my colleague uh, for her question. That is exactly the point. We just heard from the government side. They could say, look, look, we have done more than any other government. Look, we're so committed. Look, look at me. I am so great. It's what the government keeps on saying about their new nation-to-nation -nation relationship. I wonder if any of the government members realize that since the, uh, uh, the TRC calls for action has been tabled, uh, has been made public, that to date we've only realized nine. With this bill, ten. This is the pace in which we're going. It would literally take another at least 38 years to get there. And by the way, this change, Madam Speaker, is adding a line, some words, to the citizenship oath. Imagine the work that needs to be done to really implement real action and real policies and changes within the government ranks to get there. So, Madam Speaker, it has taken far too long. Indigenous peoples have to suffer injustices, they have had their children taken away, genocide has been tried to commit on Indigenous people, and they have survived. Now, if we want to talk about new nation-to-nation -nation relationship, Madam Speaker, we need to acknowledge and act within the law, and that is Section 35 of our Constitution, that is to recognize ONDRIP, and that is to recognize the Supreme Court decisions in going forward.